11 o'clock, time to go. All right, good morning, everybody. You've come to the session on software carpentry in the library. How many of you have heard of software carpentry? Oh, good, a lot of you. Excellent. <laughs> Glad to hear that. All right, it's a great, great organization, and we're having a lot of success with it, so glad you're all here. Here's what we want to cover today. We're going to do a little introduction. Uh, we're going to talk about identifying researcher needs, developing a partnership with Software Carpentry, how our hosting of workshops has come underway, what we've done to build a community around Software Carpentry. Um, and then we're going to talk about lessons we've learned. So if you're, you're early in the game, maybe you can benefit from those and how we're trying to expand this going forward. So, if you don't know me, I'm Carl Grant. I'm the Associate Dean of Knowledge Services and the Chief Technology Officer at the University of Oklahoma. A lot of people call me old hand because I've been around in this business for a long time. And of course, that means I've got a lot of experience in something. So, one of the things that I really enjoy about being an old hand though, to be perfectly honest, is identifying young librarians that have a lot of potential. And so, if you've seen your library journal this month, um, I want to point out that that person right there is this lady right here, <laughs> Sarah Clayton. And we're very proud of her. <laughs> I had to do this because she wouldn't. You know, I had, to, I had to say, but this just came out. So, you know, she's a fresh, freshly minted mover and shaker. And part of what she was recognized for was her work in software carpentry. Um, so she was one of three, I mean, 352 people were nominated from across the US. 52 made the final cut. Eight made digital content uh, de developers. She's one of those. So congratulations. Here. Okay, let me give you a little background here. Software carpentry. It started not far from here at Los Alamos National Lab by Greg Wilson back in 20 years ago. So it's been around for quite a long time. Uh, all the materials they've developed are released under a Creative Commons license. So they're all out there. Use them and do any kind of creative work you want with them. There's over 120 videos available that are, you can watch and learn from. And basically what it does, and I'm sure you all have the same problem on your campuses that we have in ours. You know, the big researchers, when they go get the big grant, they can hire their own people. But the problem is those people are dedicated to that grant. So all the smaller researchers, they don't have that. They don't have that capability. They need it. They don't often know that up front. And they don't, so they come, they come to various agencies looking for help and assistance. And we saw an opportunity there, and so did Software Carpentry. So what they offer, which is, I think, ideal, because when you take a Software Carpentry class, you're not signing up for a semester-long class. You're signing up for two days. Dedicate two days out of your life. You learn command line tools, you learn a programming language, and version control. Version control, I'm amazed at how many people dealing with technology do not understand version control. And, you know, in a research project, that's kind of important. So this is one of the things that gets taught here, and we think it's really, really important. It also offers instructor certification. One of the ways that software carpentry has grown is by doing software instructor certification routines. And so we've got a number of people on our staff that are certified as instructors. Sarah's one of these people. And I always marvel at, you know, she was kind of new to our organization and we walked down to her and said, her, you know, how'd you like to become a software carpentry instructor? And she didn't even hesitate. I mean, she was just, okay, I'll give it a try. <laughs> it was great. So we, we were really impressed by her fearless attitude. Now there are over 500 certified instructors and they travel all over the country. They get invited out to do this. Uh, we just had two of our software uh, certified instructors at the Library of Congress teaching them about this. So we felt pretty good about that. Uh, there's over 16,000 people have been through the software carpentry courses to date. So that's a lot. It's doing quite well. That's the URL. If 
you want to go get information, you can do so. Jonah Duckles, the executive director of Software Carpentry, uh, actually came out of OU. He was, uh, he, was one of, he was running our informatics group and really caught on with this and, and did well. And I really like this quote of his because I think it exactly replicates what we feel. One of the things you'll note is our, our little logo down there. We really position our library as the intellectual crossroads of the university. We do this all the time. And we do it in lots and lots of ways. Creative learning commons, digital scholarship labs, exhibitions, our Galileo World exhibition that I've spoken about at this conference before was a huge effort. So we're trying to pull people from the, all the colleges on our campus and have them intersect. And they learn from each other. The problem I see on our campus, and I'm sure you see it on your campus, they all get in their silos and they don't come out. You know, Once in a while they might show up for food somewhere. That's about it, or coffee. So we're always trying to pull them together because we know that they all have knowledge that the others can benefit from. And so if they get, get them talking, particularly around the topic, then it can be really productive and they learn and they share and they do things that build that community on your campus. One of the things that's frustrated me since I've been in, involved in this is as I've gone out and given a lot of talks around the globe, um, I find a lot of them, when I talk to them about it, go, oh, we'll leave that to IT. No, don't leave it to IT. You have all these resources in your library that you can connect researchers with that'll be of value to them. And one of the opportunities this does is to create that opportunity for you to say, you know, we could help you with it. We got something here, we got something there. It's a great way to pull them into your library, let them understand all the resources you have, all the technology you have, and if you followed us at all, you know we've done a lot with technology in the last couple of years. And so we can, we can walk them into 3D printing, we can walk them into virtual reality, we walk them into microcontrollers and software uh, learning. So all those are opportunities, and it all underscores that idea, we want to be the crossroads on the university. So you have to join Software Carpentry, and for us to join at the level we wanted it was $10,000. And of course, that's not chump change, let's be honest. So we went around campus and we formed a coalition between a whole bunch of groups. OU Libraries was one of the larger ones. We went to the Vice President of Research. We got some commitment from them. Then we went to the Colleges of Arts and Sciences because they have a huge need for these kind of skills with their faculty. We got a bio survey that was eyeball deep in needing these kind of skills. And we went to our Climate Science Center. All of these pitched in a little money, so none of us were out a whole bunch, and we were able to, to get the membership fee. Okay, thank you, Carl. So we talked a bit about these researcher needs that we saw across campus, and a lot of this information came out of Jonah and our informatics team, and also our research data management specialists who were meeting with faculty on a regular basis. And we saw this growing need to automate research processes um, both for speed and for re reproducibility, and that includes the code they're running on their, on their research, and also a lot of these labs are having changeover with graduate students through the year. And so if a graduate student from 10 years did some, ago did something, it's really great for the new graduate students to know that as well. Um, Carl mentioned this, so a lot of the less well-funded researchers in particular, they don't have any money to high pro hire programmers or informatics, or they realize they need it after they have their grant. And it's kind of too late at that point. So they're relying on those graduate students to serve that need. Unfortunately, there's no training at OU in any of the graduate curriculum on uh, research computing skills, and there's really no space for it. Um, they're about maxed out on the coursework they can have, so the graduate students need to do this work, but have to teach themselves how to do it. It's not a great model. Um, we center this training in the library, like Carl mentioned. We want the library to agree this crossroads uh, for research on campus. We have other services. We have a space. People are coming to our digital scholarship lab for interdepartmental or across department meetings. Um, it also allows us as librarians and library staff to connect better with these researchers and continue to understand their, um, their needs. And finally, we have the team. Um, we have people with the skills to teach these software um, techniques, version control, Python, 
Um, and we might as well utilize them since we already have them. <coughs> so I'm gonna go into a bit of the details of how we host these workshops locally at OU. Um, this is a photo from our most recent workshop we had at the end of March. So like Carl mentioned, these are two full day workshops starting at 9 a.m. and ending at 4.30 p.m. Um, that's a pretty big time commitment for any researcher, uh, student, faculty, anyone on the university. So if they're coming to these workshops, they must have recognized a need for this. Um, we have two certified instructors in each section. We also have multiple helpers. These are people who may already have these skills. They may be going through the certification process to be an instructor. And we really try to have uh, one helper for every table of six to eight learners. So there's always someone there to help them. We limit the participation to each workshop to about 40 uh, participants in software carpentry. We tend to call them learners because um, often they're not in the student role. Um, we found if you have more than 40 people, it's really hard to pace these workshops because they are hands-on and interactive. We found a sweet spot between 20 and 40 for each workshop works really well. And finally, we have, um, over the past year or two, we've developed a model of having three open workshops. Um, per semester, we have one at the beginning, one in the, mid in the middle, and one at the end. And this has worked pretty well, both for accommodating all the learners who want to participate, and also for not um, over, over taxing our instructor pool. And so SAR, we have hosted um, 13 open workshops. And when I say open, I mean completely open. Um, anyone from the OU community can sign up. We've even had some researchers from uh, federal projects drive down to Norman to take them and got a lot of out of them. Um, we also do additional workshops for research groups. So if there's a lab group who really wants these skills, um, may, sometimes they'll partner with another lab group so we can fill up a section. Uh, we tend to do these in the summer. This also allows us to kind of customize the workshop for data that's relevant for that research group, which is really nice. So far we've had um, over 300 faculty, graduate students, and staff participate in these workshops, and we're pretty happy with these numbers. Um, a lot of the staff have actually been from the library. Um, these skills are useful for their work and also for liaisons. They really want to take these workshops so they understand what their faculty need and can also um, refer them to this, this workshop as, as appropriate. These uh, faculty, graduate students, and staff have come from all over in the university. Um, we've had over 30 departments and research groups so far. Uh, we started very strong um, in the sciences. Microbiology and biology took up on this right away. Also, geography, meteorology, um, chemistry. We're trying to branch out into the social sciences more. This is super relevant for them. We've had some success with political science and psychology. We've had a few humanities folks take this, especially people in digital humanities. But we're trying to continue um, to expand that reach. OK. So um, this is actually the schedule for a software carpentry workshop. On day one, um, they come in right at nine and we start with using the command line and learning how to automate research uh, tasks. And that's three hours. There is a coffee break in there and the bathroom break, so no one goes crazy. Um, we also have a lunch break and then we start up with Python in the afternoon. And uh, we don't expect the learners to become experts in Python through these workshops. A lot of it is learning how to think programmatically. Um, learning what a function is, what a variable is, how you can think like a computer programmer would. On the second day, we start in with version control. We bring the learners back to the command line, have them um, create some code, start tracking it. Oh, I got ahead of myself. Uh, start tracking it with Git, and then store it with a local reposi uh, remote repository in GitHub, and also learn how to uh, collaborate on projects. In the afternoon, we continue with Python. We get a bit more advanced. When they leave the workshop, they've created some sort of visualization in Python, um, which is pretty rewarding, I think. At the end of the day, we do a wrap-up session, um, ask for feedback, tell them about continuing services we have at the library. So all of these workshops involve live coding. So we never have PowerPoint slides. Um, it's the instructor with their computer in front of a room full of people. Um, which is great and also a little intimidating for new instructors. Um, you're live coding, so I'm typing things in the command line. I tend to make a lot of typos. Uh, so we teach our instructors to turn those into learning opportunities. Um, so you make a typo, you get an error message back. That's an opportunity to look at the error message, figure out what it means, go back and debug your code. I hear tell um, 
that some people who don't make mistakes have to actually plant these in. Luckily, <laughs> I don't have that problem. Um, helpers are also there to provide on-the-spot assistance, which is really nice when you're doing interactive workshops. If someone misses one command or one click, um, it's really easy to feel hopelessly lost. So the instructors know all the workshop material and can get up and help at any time. We also use something called an etherpad as an extra assistance during these workshops. Um, so it has a place for taking uh, notes and also answering chat questions. So the helpers are also monitoring this throughout the workshop. They're adding notes, um, tips, additional resources. If someone had a question that's not very pertinent to the beginning material we're covering in software carpentry, we'll answer it in here. Um, we also have different discussions happening in the chat. You probably can't see this, but um, someone's asking what programming language would you encourage students to learn? So a couple of our helpers had different <coughs> responses to that. Um, this is a thing people love about software carpentry. dream. We've actually adapted it for other workshops because it works really well. Uh, it's the red and green sticky notes. So we give all learners a red and green sticky note at the beginning. Put a green sticky note on your computer if everything's going well. Put a red if you need help. Um, once you throw out that red sticky note, you'll be swarmed by helpers. Um, <laughs> they're literally sitting on the edge of their seat trying to, trying to help people. Um, it's also used for, for the instructors. If you're in a room and you see a sea of red sticky notes, you probably need to know you need to take a break or repeat something. We also use them for questions during the workshop. Uh, put up a green sticky note if you've worked through this Python uh, problem we posed. Put up a um, green if you're done and red if you're still working. We also use these sticky notes to collect feedback after each day. So write something on the green sticky note that you liked, something on the red um, that we could improve, and we have used these to further tailor our workshops. So I should actually click out the computer. So this is um, a green, green sticky note. So the workshop should be mandatory for every research assistant at OU. It was very useful. Um, this was really reassuring to me as an instructor that we're actually serving a need. This is probably my favorite comment. Um, so after attending this workshop, I can figure out how to begin with Python shell and GitHub. And I can learn it by myself, and I'm not afraid of it. There's a high intimidation factor when people are coming to these programming languages. And we, we can't, it's only two days, we can't teach you everything you need to know. But it's really nice to know that they have the confidence now to pursue um, these skills further. <laughs> Related to that, um, we're not leaving them hanging after we do these workshops. We build a whole community around it. Um, so we have a research data management specialist who regularly teaches them, <laughs> informatics team, um, our digital scholarship team, which I'm a part of, and our emerging technology team. Each of these teams has a public facing role. They offer consultations. They're regularly interacting with researchers. Um, we found if you spend two days in a room with an instructor, you feel pretty comfortable with them afterwards. You have a contact person, you know where to go for questions, and that's been pretty huge. Um, we also offer regular drop-in hours, both before and um, after software carpentry. We offer them twice a week. And these serve two purposes around the software <coughs> carpentry community. First, it identifies learners. So we'll have people come in saying they want to learn programming. And while we can give them resources to get them started, we can't teach every researcher at OU individually how to program. Um, so we'll say, here are a few things to get you started. Why don't you sign up for this software carpentry in two weeks? If you can't make that one, there's one in a month. Um, it also provides intermediate assistance after the workshops. So um, after each workshop, we normally have one or two researchers return the very next Thursday to find out, this is my data. I tried to do some Python on it. It's not working. Can you help me debug it? So we're not writing code in these uh, sessions, but we're helping people work through their programming and data problems. It also gives us a venue to advertise future workshops we offer at OU. Um, Carl mentioned some of these. Uh, virtual reality, 3D printing, we hold a research bazaar, which is two full days of a variety of workshops. Um, also a data visualization workshop. We had one uh, graduate student who really utilized this whole model, so I'll quickly tell her story. Um, she is a graduate student in political science. She came to our office hours saying, I want to pull all this data off the web. Our informatics team helped her write some web scraping code in Python, then said, why don't you attend this software carpentry workshop? It really builds your skills out. Through that, she connected with our digital scholarship team who helped her develop a text mining application. 
Um, she then used Python to analyze all of her results. And then last week she came to a data visualization workshop because now she's finally ready to create her graphs and finish her dissertation. So um, in addition to fostering community around our participants, we're also building community with our local instructors and helpers. Um, all of our participants at the end, we welcome them to come back and help if they enjoyed it, um, or also become an advocate. So an advocate may be someone who doesn't have the time to help or uh, teach a workshop, a lot of times faculty, but if they found the workshop useful, it's very valuable if they'll share that news um, and really become an advocate for our software carbondry program. We also offer the helpers the opportunity to become instructors through that software carpentry instructor training program. So as a member, we get to train 10 new instructors per year uh, through the certification program. We try to pick those people strategically. So we start with our own library employees who would be well suited to this. Um, we also look to IT from other departments. We just had um, an IT member from our Vice Presidents of Research Office get certified. And he's a really good advocate for um, our program in that group. Graduate students, they're a lot of the times that ones that organize those lab-specific um, software carpentry workshops. We'll let faculty advocates go through the program if it helps them um, to help spread the word. And also those partners across campus. We always make sure we save spots for them. So this training is not about programming at all. Um, it's really pedagogically focused, and I know this was mentioned in some earlier um, session, so it's two full days of learning how to teach technology, how to teach and how to teach technology. Um, these are normally done remotely. There's a few train the trainers in software carpentry. We're really lucky that our research data specialist, Mark Loffisweiler, is going through that program. So we'll be able to have a local trainer in-house, so that'll give us some more flexibility about when we're offering this. What's really great after going through this training is you're able to apply these teaching skills to other workshops we're doing um, across campus. I'll give you a preview of what these workshops look like. So this is day one of, uh, most of day one of a software carpentry training workshop. There's nothing about technology in here at all. Um, so it's, it's mainly uh, educational psychology, how memory works. It's really great. Um, I had been teaching workshops and hadn't had any of this kind of backing before then. It really changed the way I thought um, about how I gave workshops. For the second day, you do get a bit more into um, technology and live coding and why we're doing that, and also what the software carpentry um, community does as a whole. Um, so we don't learn any of the curriculum during this. There's the assumption that it will change as technology does, but the ability to teach technology won't. We organize monthly instructor meetups. Actually, one is, is happening right now in Norman. Um, so this is a place for all of our certified instructors to get together, share tips, uh, figure out some logistics. Who is teaching this workshop? Can someone please? Um, and also share brainstorming ideas for other workshop potentials or things related to software carpentry. We have a listserv for discussions in between these meetings. A lot of that is sharing resources. And then something we're piloting is having a listserv for former participants. They do have to opt into this, so we're not um, spamming anyone. But right now we're using it to tell them about events related to software carpentry and also future software carpentries. We do have some people we call software carpentry groupies um, who come and take the re workshops repeatedly. A lot of times they're about to start a project and they realize they need a refresher on version control, so they'll come to that morning. We also are encouraging our local instructors to participate in this larger software carpentry community. It really is a worldwide community. Um, there's a very active listserv they can contribute to. Um, there's GitHub, where all the software carpentry lessons are available, and like Carl mentioned, they are CC licensed. Um, so a few months ago, our instructor group got together at one of our meetings. We decided we didn't like the terminology being used in the workshop lessons. Um, it was too specific for scientific researchers. So we got together, we wrote up a draft, we sent it to the main software carpentry site. There was a um, discussion among the worldwide community and it got changed. So it's really a community that gives back and, and is very open. <coughs> we also encourage um, our instructors to teach non-local software carpentry workshops like um, our two library instructors who went to the Library of Congress. Um, this is also really useful for graduate students if they're looking to go to an institution and they've never been there before, and they see they're offering the software carpentry workshop, it's a great chance for them to go to that institution and actually start networking and meeting 
some of the people they may be working with. <coughs> and finally, there's lots of committees and discussions within the larger uh, software carpentry community, and we really encourage our local instructors to participate in that. And so I'm going to cover some of the uh, practical lessons we learned while doing software carpentry. The first is to try different scheduling patterns. Um, two days is a lot during the middle of a semester. We've actually had a lot of success doing it in spring break. Um, graduate students aren't normally gone. Uh, they don't have classes. The week of Thanksgiving works similarly. Um, we're trying a Friday, Saturday workshop schedule. We're actually doing it this Friday and Saturday, so ask me on Sunday if that works. Um, also advertise through a variety of means. So we do digital signage. We try to get on every university-wide uh, newsletter we can. Um, uh, we use social media, Facebook, Twitter. Twitter seems to be a little more successful. Uh, email individual faculty members we know who are interested. Use our former uh, participant listserv. But still, I go across campus, and I know Carl does too, and people haven't heard um, about software carpentry. So we're still working on this and just trying every outlet we can. Um, have plenty of helpers available. I've talked about them a lot. This is the number one comment we get on those green sticky notes, how great they are. So um, here's one of those. And I don't think the workshops work without helpers. I would say they're probably more important than the instructors themselves. So um, a big lesson we've learned is to be prepared for all skill levels. We advertise these as beginner workshops, so that means different things to different people. Um, sometimes we'll have people come in for a Python-based workshop, but they're advanced R programmers. So they intend to get bored um, during the session. So we offer a disclaimer at the beginning that this is a beginning workshop. We also offer the opportunity for those people to become helpers during the sections they're bored. It reinforces their own understanding to help someone else. On the other end, we have people come in who are true beginners, more beginner than we expected. Um, may have difficulty navigating around their computer. We don't turn those people away, but we do situate a helper at that table to be kind of ready assistance. Another um, practical lesson we learned is you have to have the learners come early for installation problems. There's a lot of software to install. Um, we started advertising the first day of the workshop starts at 8.30 instead of 9. Um, some people are mildly irritated, but there's coffee nearby. Um, <laughs> so. No matter, even if they followed all the instructions, there may still be a problem, so it's really great to have them early to test it so you're not in the middle of a workshop and something's not working. Also, um, an important lesson we had to learn the hard way is you need experts in both Windows and Mac. Um, this is something we got dinged on in our early software carpentry workshops. A lot of us are Mac users, and so we got a few comments like, it seems like no one had any idea about Windows, and that was a fair comment. Um, so we make sure that we have at least one Windows and one Mac user at every single workshop. Try to do it with the instructor. Sometimes that doesn't work out, but at least helpers. And then the final lesson we've learned is you have to host these workshops in strategic locations. So this is our um, Helmert Collaborative Learning Center classroom. And it's got lots of screens, uh, flexible seating, round tables that work well for a helper at each table. We've also hosted the workshop at our innovation hub, which is on the research campus. Um, and this is a comment from that workshop. So the organization of furniture and screens made an open learning environment. So the setup is really nice. Also important is where these positions are on campus and in our, our library. So this Helmut Collaborative Learning Center classroom is right next door to the digital scholarship lab where we hold those office hours. So it's really easy to say at the end of the workshop, come back on Thursday in that other glass room next door and you can get help. For the um, Innovation Hub, this is on our research campus, uh, South Campus, and it's a lot easier for researchers to come there, just walk across the street where they're normally uh, used to going. There's parking. Um, and also, in the Innovation Hub, there's lots of tools. There's virtual reality. There's um, machinery that you can make prototypes with, 3D printers, laser cutters. So it's all better to see while they're at these workshops so they can think of potential uses for those tools. With that, I'll hand it back over to Carl. So, you know, I think I, I just would want to underscore what Sarah was saying there in that this really has become a nucleus on our campus to interconnect all the other services we do. You know, the informatics group, our, our liaisons, and all of our 
you know, data management people. We can connect them all to these researchers and they get uh, better embedded. And we as the librarian get embedded in what they're doing. And that's of course what we've been trying to do for quite a while. And I think we're, we're being quite successful with that. So, you know, we, we see this as a really important program. I think we've spent a lot of time building the community around the effort in order to sustain it over the long term. We don't see it going away. Uh, we have noticed that the number of people that are coming through the classes is kind of stabilized. You know, it's not growing radically, but it's new people coming through in many cases. So we, we're teaching more and more. Um, and as we help build the instructor base and pass and, you know, move them across the countryside, um, we're, we're spreading the effort. So we're, we're actively trying to expand the program. So we're actively training uh, more instructors, and we're happy to have them go out across the campus and do, do that. And it also means less time commitment from our current instructors, so they're happy about that. We're improving outreach through our community. You know, Sarah's outlined a number of the steps we've gone through there to make sure that they are also acting as advocates for us. And we've gotten a lot of PR. You know, we had an article in Library Journal about this, so you know, we've seen press there. Um, like we said, we got invited to the Library of Congress. That was a nice, you know, put our face in front of a lot of important people. Uh, so it's, it's been good for us, really good for us. And we're starting to think about offering a larger variety of programming languages, moving beyond just Python, in order to do this. Also remember, with the carpentry effort, there is a data carpentry uh, piece that's been spun up, and that's looking very promising. We're, we're early into that effort. We don't really have a lot of experience with it, but we feel very good about it, because we want to teach the researchers how to handle the research data <laughs> and how to store it and preserve it. So we're doing that. And there's also a library carpentry effort started up. So there's enough people in libraries paying attention to this that we've now got a, a library community uh, starting up in this. So that's good, I think a very positive sign. The other thing we're doing is trying to form more regional uh, relationships across uh, our geographic area. So we, we've got a, a relationship going with Oklahoma State University. Uh, they ha also have some certified instructors now, and so we, we can flip courses with them. Research Bazaar, um, which Sarah mentioned, is a program, again, another global program, where we run that and we invite researchers to come in and we teach them all kinds of skills, not just software carpentry, but it's been really uh, very valuable. And, and I think one of the nice things that we've seen come out of that, as a side note, is you know, we have a lot of um, young people working in our innovation at the edge, our 3D makerspace, you know, microcontroller, um, virtual reality lab. And so we've used the research bazaar to have researchers talk about their projects, what they're doing in research, to the degree they're willing to expose that. Um, and then we have our students come down from the lab, and we have a huge volunteer force that works in our innovation at the edge. And they talk about the skills they've learned in our innovation at the edge. And we're seeing the researchers hire the students for specific tasks, but it helps them to get their needs addressed in their research work. Uh, and it gives these students paying gigs, so they're thrilled. Uh, but it's been a really nice benefit. And it's, a, you know, it's a direct result of us getting the researchers in there, listening to their needs, hearing them say, hey, I need somebody to do this. Do you know if anybody can do Well, we're, we're being a little more proactive in trying to deal with that. Tell us what your problems are. We have students there, and if they feel like they might be able to handle them, they can talk to them. They don't force anything, but we facilitate. We're also working with the University of North Texas now. Uh, so we're going to build a little regional consortium of software carpentry and, and try and roll that out. I think this has all kinds of potential. I know we're all fighting with issues of, for instance, uh, you know, funding. Uh, so you know, I think these are workshops that ultimately we might be able to expand out and you know, maybe we run out dorm rooms for a, a week or something, do something longer, or set up a whole program where you could learn a lot of different skills. And you know, I see, I see an opportunity out there for us to, to use this to start dealing with some of the funding issues that we're all fighting. And of course, we're organizing more annual meetups uh, and opportunities for formal workshop attendees. So um, we're really pleased with the program. We think it's had a lot of a lot of success for the library. It really does underscore that message we put out there. We're the crossroads. Come and see us. We'll, we'll connect you with others who are either working in the same area. 
it's been very satisfying to see the researchers share code. Um, and we've got some software we're working on that will further facilitate that form. So we see uh, a larger initiative in all of this in that, you know, I'm still trying to drive, I, I have talked in the past about the knowledge creation platform. You know, as, as librarians, I get very frustrated with us trying to compete with Google. And I keep saying what we need is a massive differentiation to pull them back into the library. And so I keep moving us towards a platform where the researchers can log on, they can look at research, they can reach behind it and get the data that's driving it, they can use skills learned in software carpentry to manipulate that data, do new research, start a research paper, do it in open journal system, publish that paper, get it peer reviewed, get it published, drop it in the repository, cycle around and do it again. That's not the kind of thing they can get in Google or Google Scholar. And that would differentiate us and give us new value in the marketplace. I think we're all losing the battle to Google. And, you know, if we're moving towards linked data, we're, we're forcing our stuff out there, and that's great. But once they come back to our discovery systems out of Google, what are we going to offer them that makes it different? And if it's just linking to the item, I don't think we're doing our jobs, folks. So I'm trying to build that infrastructure that moves us towards the knowledge creation platform which I see as, uh, at least in the research library, is a very important package that we might be able to offer our researchers in the long term. Okay, that's, uh, that's the end. Q&A.